Hello there everyone and welcome to the start of a new campaign in Tiano, the Lassies of Europe, in which we are playing as Yunnan. So if you'd like to hear about Yunnan, please go right ahead. And which this campaign is probably going to be going a little crazy, a little crazy, especially with a certain long Yun that we will eventually be playing as. So, go next page, go forward to Prosperity. But we shall begin with in the West. Without the aid of the capital and below the notice of the Japanese, the people of the Southwest must fend for themselves. In the mountains and fields, we only have ourselves to turn to for justice, order, and progress. And it's Zuhan to, to whom we turn. I'll uh, get some stability. Everything for my friends. Get more political power. Minerals for those who can pay. The law for my enemies. Slander and lies have no place in Yunnan, at least not when they're in opposition to our government. The law is quite clear about what happens to those found guilty of whatever the court finds them guilty of. And the courts know their duty very well. So here, actually, I, I forgot to set us up, huh? Um, we're going to need some trains, definitely. Um, support equipment and, and artillery. Ooh. Get some Marty first. And get some, uh, uh, support equipment. And then, for guns, we'll probably just try to max that out, honestly. Other than that, um, I'm not really sure what else. Oh, maybe some motorized, if we even can get that. Maybe one motorized for supply, maybe. You know, supply, supply might not be too bad for us, overall. So, I could be very wrong. Um, if... In the comments below, of course, let me know how you would do a Long Yun Yunnan run, because I would like to know. Because I want to make sure that we can do this, hopefully, quite well. Let's see, exercise. I just know we want as much, as many guns as possible, because it's going to be kind of nuts trying to defeat China. Oh, we're going to anti-tank as well. Crap. Anti-tank equipment as well. Uh, yeah, we're going to need some anti-tank. I don't know if we can afford all this stuff. Maybe we not. We might not be able to. I'm gonna probably do, end up doing some funky stuff here to make sure we do really, really well. But we currently have a planned economy. Better situation first. Yunnan, the southwest most periphery of China, a uh, serene little state, picturesque and mountainous, covered in dense forests that buzz with every variety of life. Watching over the peasant who tills the fields, who works the mines and carries the tremendous weight on their backs, is Lu Han, having inherited Yunnan's position as supreme authority from his cousin Long Yun more than a decade ago. Within Yunnan are the Yi people, a minority who owns most of the land in Yunnan and of whom Lu Han is now the undisputed leader. Outside of Yunnan, the Yunnan clique answers only to the Nanjing Nationalist Government, China's sole legitimate sovereign, with slight autonomy granted and turn return to boot. While maintaining this balance between the wealthy privileged elite at home and his brethren superiors just across China's mountains and rivers, Luan assures its own and by extension Yunnan's safety and security. Despite being what the unkind and foolish may label a warlord, Lu Han has very little interest in warring. True, those bandits skirting our borders, NRA elements, communists, these ghosts of the past on serenity, they are thrown to our side, but they amount to little more than a trifling distraction. For Lu has a mandate to keep, a greater good to contribute to. For at the very this at this very moment, the Republic's five modernizations roar the heavens and inject our motherland with an inexhaustible industrial vitality. And to the righteous cause, we selflessly devote Yunnan soil and the wealth of them. We extract, we sell. We harvest, we sell. Let us provide the firmament under which our mighty brethren shall twist the raw material of nature into the, the wonders of civilization. We must not and cannot forget our place, and if enemies lurk in the dark, both within and without our borders, we must tread carefully, but forcefully. On sure feet, we march towards a better future, for Yunnan, China, and for Luhan, onwards. Followed up with, minerals for those who can pay. Yunnan has been blessed with an abundance of resources lying within the ground, and cursed with a drought of cash with which to access it. A newly discovered deposit may send investors scurrying to the Luhan to gain his favor and slander the opponents, but in the end, Luhan must accept payment from wherever the capital flows, so long as it does flow. Luhan. When the dust of the son of Japanese war had settled in, there remained not left but to determine how to surrender. One thing was made clear by Tokyo. Long Yun, the king of Yunnan, the one hero who stood for the Chinese people, he had to go. The man was simply too influential, however too much danger for the Nanjing government. A death position, nothing, a nothing job would be more preferable. The only other figure that could then take up the mantle of leader would be his cousin by marriage, Lu Han. And so it happened, that Lu Han ascended to the position of leader of Yunnan. Not by the people's will, not by the clever political machinations, not by force of arms. Simply as the only other option. At first it was difficult, managing reconstruction, fulfilling the Nanjing government and Tokyo's endless hunger for resources and men, exercising his duty while in constant watch out for assassins, malcontents, and the seemingly endless stream of traitors, defectors, and other useless delusionals, still unaware that the war had ended and China, however bitter may be, had lost. But, as with anything, slowly Lu Han grew to fit his new role. He learned of the many ways to get around Lu Yunnan's endless deficiencies and weaknesses, the men lurking in the shadows with armies and treasures behind them that could be enticed to support the government. The long peace corroded both his inner spirit and his naivety, and produced a statesman with sharp eyes and sharper ears, a national fervor that once burned so brightly now smolders away quietly. Perhaps it may never reignite, or perhaps it may. Nevertheless, Luhan, 
Now sits atop of a precarious corpse of power held aloft by myriad promises to landlords and the wealthy, continued assurances of the fealty to the Nanjing regime in exchange for autonomy and above all else. The disorganization of all the groups that could potentially unseat him, as long as this situation remains stable, he, so will he, and so will you not. So let's hope no one tries to rock the boat. Everything for my friends, though. It's only natural that these, those who would play such a prominent role in both the stability and advancement of Yunnan would be rewarded in turn. Lu Han would not even think of his good friends and allies having anything less than the first pick of the province. After all, they earned it. Long Yun. The name of Long Yun is a famous one not just in his home province, but all across China. The King of Yunnan, the stalwart anti-Japanese force, wise administrator and leader of, all, uh, leader of the people, all epithets he had received at some point or another, all of which now gather dust as he sits on a paper throne as a ceremonial head of government. A nothing job, the sole purpose of which is to legitimize an administration that betrays every pr principle he has ever had. Led by his cousin, a man more palatable as a leader of the Yunnan to the Japanese forces. It was not always like this. There was once a time all the nation was ablaze with righteous fury against a Japanese invader, when he knew who was his friend and who was foe, and the peasants knew there was a leader who stood for them. But those days are long past then. Now those peasants are ground to dust systematically under the boot of Japan's lapdogs, with no voice of complaint allowed to issue from them. The fire and fury of the war have been replaced with dead-eyed resignation from the shattered villages populated solely by women who still hang pictures on the walls of their missing halves, to the mines and farms that ripped the green earth bounty from the soil to be shipped off to the sea, far, far away from Yunnan, to the cities littered with veterans who lost their limbs fighting against the men who now dictate their very existence, a nuisance to public order. Ever long you looks, all I can see is a bitter legacy of a lost war. It cannot continue like this. Even the spies and turns goats listening at every corner whispers travel of men with arms who still believe in the old ways, who still believe in the sanctity of justice, and who still remember the, long, the time he, Long Yun, led them against a despicable invader. A quiet flame still burns in Jinan, and if the traitors in Nanjing and the devils in Tokyo refuse to hear the cries of his people, there always remains the option to light it with a torch or a vault. Once upon a time, it was fire that burned away the locusts that threatened to feast on Yunnan's bosom. It would be the same fire that burns away the plague that now infests all of China, the National Southwestern Associated University. Since the Japanese were prevented from attacking the territories in the far west of China before peace was signed, the citizens of those regions enjoyed significant greater freedom than their brethren held in the subjugation of the Nanjing government. As a result, in the aftermath of the Second uh, Sino-Japanese War, the province of Sunan became one of the last bastions of free Chinese intellectualism as refugees fled to the southwest from the now enslaved homeland. The National Southwestern Associated University, called the NSAU in short in English, was a prime example of this. Of course, the Nanjing and Tokyo governments knew this. They constantly sent letters and threats. All of them impotent. There was nothing that either could do at such a distance for something so relatively inconsequential. Demand that the NSAU be subject to restrictions or brought into closer harmony with the Pan-Asian concept. <clears throat> Both Luhan and Long Yun took great pride in rubbishing any and all such demands when they came. As a result, the NSAU enjoyed significant academic freedom despite the presence of a large group of Japanophiles. Thanks to the influence of this free university, the United States education was one of the best in the ROGOC regime in terms of academic quality and learning atmosphere. However, there's a drawback to this. The intellectuals, rather than think thinking Lu Han or his for his magnanimity towards them, became increasingly dissatisfied with Lu Han's collaborationism and more and more sympathetic to the NPA movement, they began to hope against hope that the legacy of that National Protection War would be reborn one day and the spirit of the May 4th movement would be inherited and restored to glory. But it's not yet to be. There was no ca Kai Yi leading them, so they all did it for now as they resort to limited protests and small gestures of assistance to the insurgencies for the moment. However, that could change at the top drop of a hat. Jinan insurgency. Oh, yeah. We definitely have to think about that. And definitely think about that we will. Actually. Oh, we have nothing here. We have three. F oh, God. We have four now. Do we even need to build? I'd rather have more guns. You know what? We probably need more guns. Yeah. Oh, we're probably not even building guns now. That's right. Not bad. Well. Maybe we don't need motorized. Then again, we're not even building it, so. Artillery would be nice. We'll build probably quite a few trains and then probably not use them, but we'll see. Ah, a new finding of tin. An archaeological project being undertaken by all three members of the Kunming Antiquarian Society has been attempting to uncover an ancient village that was burned down during the Taiping Rebellion. Early efforts have been promising already enough shreds or shards or shards. The fell wheelbarrow have been uncovered and the foundations of a large stone house have made them very excited, far more impressively. An agent of ours has relayed that these three antiquarians have accidentally discovered a very promising vein of tin. A surveyor dispatched from Kunming has written a book explaining that not only have they found a single promising vein, but that the whole local area is dotted with veins and outcroppings, which suggests that it's the ideal place to begin a whole complex of mines. Tin is one of our biggest exports already, and building up a raw material extraction can only bring good things into this great state. Mineral wealth is the wealth of the kings, it is the wealth of the gods, and it shall be the wealth of Yunnan. We were fully prepared to seize it from the current owners when we were pleasantly surprised to learn that the site already belongs to the government. We must merely decide what to do with it. 
Before we sign off on this decision, we needed to address a letter we have received from the Kunming Antiquarian Society begging us to give them just a few more days to remove everything of historical significance from the site. Permission denied in the Jinan insurgency. Soon before Guizhou finally entered a truce. State of Union with Yunnan, a wide variety of resistance movements and partisans have come with it, from the National Revolutionary Army making pushes for a long dead republicanism of Sun Yat sen and Chiang Kai shek, the masses of bandits robbing government assets, the remnants of the Chinese Communist Party along the Vietnamese border, and the MPA fighting under the banner of nationalism, Luhan has his work cut out for him. Assuming we have enough resources and enough time, we will find no trouble in eliminating these insurgents, we, even so. We have no reason not to make a heavy push against these resistance movements, and ensure that all of Yunnan is integrated into Yunnan as soon as possible. The binding begins, or bidding begins. News moves slowly in Yunnan. An instruction can be sent into uh, a provincial office, and they can spend weeks deliberating their answer before sending it back. It can take months for couriers to carry messages from the sticks to the halls of power. A cousin of the Minister for Financial Affairs insisted she found a village in the south that still thought Yuan Shikai was the emperor. So when 20 communiques are received in one day, the office goes in a bit of a panic. It seems everyone wants to get their hands on our tin. Tin for bronze, tin for canned goods, tin for all the sphere flowing from Yunnan. We thought we'd make a little money, a little bit of money. Well, we're not. We're going to be making a tremendous amount of money. Early estimates have already been exceeded. The advantage we have right now is that this is a secret auction. None of the interested parties making the bids know how much anyone else is also bidding. This is going to spread like wildfire we had, we had last year. So only we want to cover this one up. May the highest bid win. A nudge in the right direction? There's a, s a side bet in the office as who's going to get the contract. The Zaibatsus have the most capital but the least interest. The reorganized government wants to build up Chinese industries with the Chinese resources, and they may well seek a symbolic victory over our mutual masters. The best odds are neither of those two, but on the perennial favor, the locals, a cabal of landowners keen to maintain their hegemony over Yunnan's land industry, are scrambling to pull enough resources to get to compete with the big boys. This auction doesn't need to be left to chance. We can push a thumb on the scales, after all, only we know what the bids are. We can make we can favor our own people, ensure that the great state of Yunnan. What we made even greater by keeping our hands in our own pockets. We can favor the Republic, drawing Yunnan and China close again once more. Or we can favor the Japanese, opening the door to the ruthless exploitation and advanced mining techniques of the Zaibatsus. Hmm. Reorganized government wants to build up Chinese industry with Chinese resources. Uh. Cabal of Yi landowners. I want industry. Favor the empire? No. Keep our hands out of this? No. Oh, ye landowners. Because they have maintain hegemony over land and industry. We'll see. Feeding your own hand. No man becomes rich by giving things away, of course. As it is for men, so two states, it is for states as great as you know. The wealthy hands of Nanjing and Tokyo are grasping at our trousers, but our pockets, line, be, our pockets belong to our own hands. Thank you very much. The landowners, are who are such an important part of our society, have expressed an interest in our new tin reserve. They have come together in a bit of a cabal to put forward a serious bid on the site. Their efforts are unlaudable, as well as most certainly patriotic, but they're not exactly up to scratch. However plucky our land local landlords may be, they just don't have the resources to compete with the great corporations of Japan or the vested, vested interests of the reorganized government. Even putting their slaves on the table, they can't meet half the biggest offer we've got from abroad, but then again, only we know that. We're going to ensure that our own investors get the land. They deserve it. They're the hard-working landowners and slave traders who make this country work. That's our noble obligation as a government to protect them and their interests from foreign interference, even if the interference is legal and purely economic. Furthermore, while both the reorganized government and the Japanese will simply pay us a lump sum that extracts as much wealth as they can physically get and stash it in the treasuries, this way the wealth we rip from the earth will circulate inside Yunnan for much, much longer. We are nothing if not a state that works, a work state, and like all workers, we simply want to keep as much of our earnings as we can. Furthermore, if we make a purely domestic venture, that we can waive all these pesky regulations and high wages and ensure that the local villagers have something to do all day. Profit comes first. <clears throat> the rising sun raises the bid. The stoic mounds of Yunnan are a solid manifestation of stream beauty. An immortal fact reality that we mortals weave our petty human notions of cities and nations around every peak, every valley is a symbol of our pride and dedication. You know, I may be made out of stone, but our hearts are not. <clears throat> we sincerely wanted to benefit the Yunnan owners. We really believe that it was in our economic interest to keep the material wealth of this nation inside the nation, not to carry it over worn out roads to foreign masters thousands of miles away. For this lot to go, we were willing to fudge our numbers to artificially double the bid of the Yi landowners, putting them in just the lead. But then the Japanese raised their bid. Oh my, did they raise their bid. They didn't double it, they added zeros. We can't resist that kind of money. We can't match it even by fiddling the books. We've got no choice. But on the plus side, we're going to make so much money, a truly ludicrous sum of money. The economic benefits of selling out our morals is great, but selling out from the selling out pays even better. It's vitally important we realize that this is a benefit to Yunnan. It is. <clears throat> Far more important that the Yi landowners understand that this is in their interest too. It isn't, but they live in Yunnan, and Yunnan is going to benefit, so they'll really benefit too. A new age of investment and development awaits us. A new deal, where no peasant will go be, ever be idle, and no landowner, over, landowner will ever be poor. Yunnan is great and shall, and shall be greater still. Money is money. 
On solid ground. Two brothers. Um, the warmongers. Bandits of the southwest. The red menace. Ghosts of the past. Reduces NRI power by five. Burma Road Revival. Reduce CC speed power. Ooh, admin efficiency. That's really strong. As uses as Bao Dai is, at least you can take some nominal actions against the Viet Cong that can slightly improve the effectiveness of countermeasures. Please would be more effective hunting down bandits. Um, begin to slowly worsen. We want to do that one last. Oh, this one first. Red Menace. There are few enemies to the Luhan who are as popular among the rural populace as the remnants of the Chinese Communist Party. Even as the movement has been crushed twice before, it seems as though it's high time that the CCP is crushed a third time by the hand of Luhan. If that is what it takes. While the CCP has proven to be among the trickiest resistance groups of China, their methods of opposing the government have grown predictable. Exploring these patterns would prove essential to securing Yunnan. As the CCP has proven itself competent at bringing rural regions to its side, it's high time that extra garrisons are posted in the region. Cracking down on these operations from the CCP will only strengthen Luhan's position within Yunnan. And you know, I won't become stronger as a result. <clears throat> if all goes to plan, there won't be any need to worry over these communists, and the vast sprawling lands of Yunnan and Jinan will only be mended closer together. <clears throat> the third option. The Tarrants would like to impose on Yunnan's peasantry that there are only two choices for them, work or die. In reality, they had neither. Those who did not work were killed, and only those who were dead did not have to work. There were those who proclaimed that there was a third choice, to stand and fight, to take the, up the traditions of China's innumerable popular revolts, and show the fat parasites who lorded over them, that there was spirit still in the minds of workers and peasants by 62, every single one of them had failed. <clears throat> From strikes to outright revolt, it seemed that without a unifying figure, the rage of the masses dispersed in a thousand directions, affecting nobody that had aimed for and harming everyone who had participated in them. The idea of challenging authority itself had become associated with the brutal reprisals that inev inevitably came after. The int intentional deprivations and starving of families that had already only scraped by day after day. Most of those men willing to fight have now vanished into the forest and mountains, having joined some group or some other waiting for their opportunities. <coughs> those men now bide their time huddled around fires, remembering the days when tyranny was overthrown, even for a little while, and the dreams of the masses rose as high as the embers that lit their faces, the Taiping Rebellion, the Xinhai Re Revolution. Even if one movement failed, others eventually succeeded, and if one man died, a hundred would take his place. Who's been visiting the villages and towns see only the defeated faces they are presented with, hear only the stories of resignation and surrender. And it is true. There are a few left that would act in defiance themselves. But the simmering range of hundreds of lost sons, thousands of lost kin, and millions of lost countrymen does not easily dissipate even with the, in, with the decades past. And as this rage grows, all that is left for the floodgates to truly open one last time is the missing ingredient, the lack of which darned every previous attempt. And the back of every mind in Yunnan whispers a single wish. Give us a leader. Japan wins a bit. After months of selling out intense back and forth uh, negotiations, Japan has finally won, surprising no one. Our meddling is not going unnoticed by the world, and we've lost no small amount of political and diplomatic weight as a result. What well, we have lost, however, we've gained an actual capital. Money flows from Tokyo to Kunming like a golden river, showering us in radiant wealth. Well, it's more of a trickle. Despite promises and backroom dealings, the money isn't quite what we thought it would be. Installments, deductibles, compensations, the counties of Japan are more deadly than their battleships. As much or more wealth flows up the river to Tokyo as it does down to Kunming, the office is gloomy. Even he, who won a spectacular personal fortune in the office pool, seems kin to hide happiness that he may feel. The general sense among both ourselves and the public is that we've completely mismanaged this. We've misstepped and annoyed our neighbors, our people, and even ourselves. We should have never meddled, but it's all in the past now. As I bought two agents fill their bars, spilling out into the streets, even while they drink, they earn a fortune every hour, and the hatred of hundreds of every minute. The most modern machines, operated by the most modern engineers, tower over our villages as they begin the long, slow march out of Japanese lands. The fields and rivers turn from clear to brown to gray to black. The peasants go from strong to sick to weak to dead. <laughs> if war is a racket, we've lost. Woe to the vanquished. To the winner goes the spoils. Also, we have this one, of course, like I said earlier. If we're going to this game, please go ahead. I don't know why I said that, but whatever. So we have, of course, untapped potential, which sucks big, fat suckage. Army of Southwest is pretty good, though. And the road to prosperity. So this one... Our GDP growth increased by 0.3%, which is great. More resource efficiency gain. Better consumer goods production factor. Oh, cool. You now will receive a small source of permanent income, amounting to $150 million. Oh, that's very nice. Cool. Should plus, not bad. We have a planned economy, of course. Ooh, that's a new month. We don't have very much growth, but you know, what else can we do about it? I'm going to read about planned economy. Or planned economy. Or a command economy, really. It's an economic system in which... The entirety of the economic output and growth uh, is planned in advance to account for the needs of the population of the country as a whole. Such a planification can be either centralized or decentralized, and can be decided either by dedicated council workers or experts, or by the people in a participatory manner. Oh, I forgot about this too. Crap. We're going to spend a little bit more, but yeah, I definitely want more uh, spending there. That should help out just slightly. So, the Xinhai Revolution, or I guess Insurgency, which I, I'm trying to follow a guide 
to see what we can do here. I'm not sure how many people have actually played uh, as, of course, Yunnan um, in total. Like, with no step back. Of course, toolbox theory, but no step back. So, that's what I said at the beginning. If, if you know you know how to do it perfectly, hey, let me know. And I've heard that you don't really care about the Jinhai Revolution, or Jinan, I guess I should say. It's not super, super important, maybe, so... A step downstairs. We both know why fu fully why you're here, Chan, but what, what, what I want to know is who would even begin to want to oppose me. Who could possibly be so misguided? Luhan has spent the morning looking over the small mountain of reports on the growing resistance within Yunnan, and said that even the sheer amount of reports was concerning. It would be adequate, inadequate, let alone what the reports themselves contain. In short, air. Oh, sir, sir, I mean, sir. Uh, there are roughly four separate insurgencies within Yunnan as if at this moment, namely the bands of the southwest, or currently isolating themselves within the mountains of mountainous terrain, which have proved a substantial challenge to law enforcement efforts. Where there are the remnants of the National Revolutionary Army fighting within the Burma Row, which has caused some trouble with transportation. There are Chinese Communist Party fighting within the rural regions, and that's all to say nothing of the so-called National Protection Army. This movement, within our own armed forces, fomenting their nationalism and revanchism, as you know. Lu Han nodded and stood up from his desk, walking towards the glorified accountants of Chen. Now, Chen. Uh, what would you recommend that I do about these insurgents? It seems that we have enemies on every corner in every facet of our government. We cannot stand with this subversion tearing us apart uh, from the inside. Now, what do you say I do about it? Chen stood quiet for a moment, thinking as to what he should say. Root them out, sir, Lu Han smiled. Exactly. That is exactly what I plan to do, and no, I will not stop until you're not safe. Safe from all those who would hope to tear it down. Lu Han gestured uh, towards the door, and Chen nodded before walking out of the office. Lu Han sat back down on his desk and poured himself a drink. It's going to be a long night. While it's important for Luhan to crush down the insurgents for his regime, there, others may have different opinions towards him. Oh, crap, we have this disease here. Threats. Oh, look at this. Holy crap. Um, the Chinese Communist Party continues to accumulate support within the rural regions, of course, gaining popularity for their populism against our loyal landlords. While they are still largely relevant at the present, they're still disrupting the actions of the state, and we need to keep an eye on them, lest they grow beyond recognition. The first group to oppose the rule of the remnants of the National Revolutionary Army. <clears throat> along the Burma Road, which has disrupted traffic with ourselves in Burma, not to mention constantly raiding government assets and armed depots. While they are far more, far from on track to overthrow a rule, we still need to dispose of them in due time. Internal threats. The bandits of the southwestern mountains have caused incredible pain for landlords as they have robbed our businessmen of their rifle profits. These seeds have only caused problems for the state and they are not liable to stop until we put a stop to these activities. Oh crap, growth goes way down and we get worse growth. Hold, oh, oh, factory apple. Jesus. And the greatest threat to Luhan's government at this point in time is not a foe from without, but an opponent from within. The NPA movement within the military and the upper administration has grown beyond belief and continues to attempt to return to China to an age of nationalism and revanchist ideals. To secure state, we'll need to put an end to this outdated belief one way or another. So what do we have here? Focus on the CCP. Strengthen other movements. Oh, we can actually strengthen other movements. Improve our administration in rural areas. Oh, that is very strong. More admin efficiency? I'd be a fool not to take that one. Focus on the bandits. We can bandit power over time to strengthen other movements. I'm not worried about bandits. If anything, I want to strengthen Lu Han, but, you know. Focus on the NPA. Yeah, there'd be no point to do that. So, I've been recommended to keep keep, keep taking, uh, let's see, the 50 political power decisions. Uh, this one's not bad. I think it's this one we re... Uh, we have to do that one. Like, we have to do that one. And I'm not entirely sure. We can CP to strengthen other movements to shift our focus. Through the army situation, we need more guns. Oh, we need more guns. Into incarceration, public education. Yeah, I don't know about that one. No. And this is NPA. This one's just bandits. This was NRA. Cool. Um, yeah, we need some. Oh god. We have to get that one. Yeah, we need more guns. So you know what? I'm gonna assume we don't need trains. It's probably a bad thing. So we have five trains. Five trains is good, right? Right? It, oh, these are some really good divisions. I might actually take off Recon. Because we're going to need some serious units here. I think what we're going to do is get as much many guns first as possible. Improve the army situation because we need that military professionalism improvement. But the hordes of partisans. Chinese Communist Party has always provided our troops with a near impossible challenge with every engagement they begin, which is exactly what causes the British soldiers so, so much trouble. They're never the first to start a fight. The CCP force have always been the first to strike and has only caused tragedy for troops on the ground as ambush after ambush. And all our soldiers can do is fight back with useless volleys of inadequate gunfire. What can we do then? Our methods are useless or inadequate. It's high time we do what we can to change them. Unfortunately, we do what we can to change them. Oh no, 
We may not be able to, if, unfortunately. If we found a way to counter these partisan tactics, we will need to reroute the combat docks for anti-partisan soldiers. If we had a doctrine to redistribute, we would need to retrain our troops and project a, pro and a project of unparalleled scale. As a result, there's little which can be done against these insurgents, not to say we won't try. The Zealot admits the intellectuals of the NSAU. One young teacher stood out or stood head and shoulders above the rest. Jing Zemin, the professor of electrical engineering. This man was one of the most talented and passionate academic academicians the college had ever seen. But academic qualities alone did not contribute to Zhang's fame. What made him outshine his peers was his particularly progressive, albeit subtle, political views. Most notable of all were two things. First, his zealous hatred for Japan's colonialism that had passed off as Pan-Asianism. And second, his open and ha hash. Huh. Or maybe rash disgust towards Lu Han's program of collaboration with Nanjing. And then came as no surprise that Zhang was known to sympathize openly with insurgencies, particularly the MPA. In furtherance of that ideology, nowadays he had to even start holding some talks and lectures in the humanities. While his influence was growing day by day, Jiang currently was merely treated as some, somewhat sympathetic with the reformists led by the Tao Zhang, an old friend of the president himself. Zhang's proactivity and Nanjing matter only when re only reinforced this view. This combined with the relative academic freedom seen in the NSAU and the fact that as far as anyone knew Zhang only spoke and did not act, he had protected Zhang for the trouble thus far, of course. If they realized what Zhang was really up to, he would be arrested and even beheaded as a traitor and reactionary, fortunately for Zhang. Most others knew nothing about him beyond the basics that have been stated above. The complete picture of Zhang and his actions was known only to a few, almost all outsiders far away from Liu Han's reach. Nonetheless, Zhang was now a rising star in Yunnan as proof of the growing reformist influence. As they had known just how much Yunnan would be influenced by the zealous young man. Someone to watch out for? Oh, yes, yes. As Chris was doing this stuff as well, uh, improve our administration in rural areas. Oh, yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. And they were, of course, still doing the Red Menace. And we are, of course, led by this guy. Who can see his eyes through sunglasses, which is weird, but it should pass in a way. He pushed another branch out of his way, made another glance behind him. Somehow, nobody in his trio had gone lost so far, at least assuming his guide hadn't slipped up, which wouldn't be all that hard to believe considering he was supposed to be going straight for the Vietnamese HQ, although he had been walking through the jungle for roughly an hour by now. Had it not been for the constant reassurances from the guide who hardly spoke a lick of Chinese, Li would have been completely fallen into despair, even though with every step deeper and deeper in the Vietnamese jungles, Li's face further eroded, stopping in the middle of a small clearing of brush. The guy whose name had slipped Lee's mind began tapping away at the ground with his foot. Looking around himself, Lee felt like it was it. Lu Han had found a way to get his hands all around Vietnam, and Lee's life was about to be snuffed out by an ambush in who knows where Vietnam. It was in the ground had flung open, and a hole had opened up on the jungle floor first. Lee stood in absolute ast astonishment as the rest of his toupee gathered around him and watched on in horror as the guys squeezed into the ground, uh, waving their hand for the trio to enter the hole before submerging completely. What the F? The three looked around at one another before Lee took a step forward. Lee, that seems like a effing horrible idea. No offense. Lee hesitantly took another step forward, like he was trying to sneak past the brush. I'm not getting anywhere you st just standing here, Lang. Now, are you coming or not? It was obvious that that not even Lee was confident in his decision. Fine, Captain, take the lead. And then establish rural area network. If we ever have to put a firm stop to the Chinese Communist Party's activities, we must do whatever we can to help their growth. While our efforts to combat these threats have been increasingly effective, it's nowhere near fast enough to com probably combat the unrestrained growth of the CCP's forces. While we may not be able to halt the growth of resistance by actively combating it, we may still be able to cut off this snake at its head. Through establishing connections within the rural communities in which the CCP flourishes in, we will be able to infiltrate these insurgents and cause chaos within their ranks. While far from a permanent solution, it will allow us to also identify future attacks against government assets. It will take time, but we are certainly cutting down on these communists. It's far from the end, but we are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. This is a great thing. And we're going to rush these guns. We want at least these guns as fast as possible. Insurgents, these are acting. Oh. I mean, this one, I was recommended to take this one, but I don't think it, this one would be good. Of course, the guy that did look, did come out after, did come out before um, No Step Back, or at least Toolbox 3 came out, so. Doing this one just doesn't make any sense. This stuff, I mean, I don't really care too much, I'll be honest. Focus on the MPA. Uh, I don't want to lose any more political power. It, 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 won't, it won't be worth it. I don't want her to need to consumer goods. I don't want to do that either. So, you know what, whatever. Who controls what? Another trip home from Vietnam, another patrol, another day was shot. A son of everybody gun to get set over at Yunnan, and Lee had felt that he spent his day well enough. Undoubtedly quiet, it always paid to have a quiet day. Walking through the dirt intersection of what could technically be a market and the beginning of a long path of farmers, Lee took a moment to appreciate the humid air of the rice paddies. Walking alongside his pair of comrades, Lee couldn't really do much else but appreciate the boredom, after all. There was little to do beyond keeping an eye out for Yunnan soldiers, and it was always nice to see people waving to them when passing by. It wasn't like the CCP was wanting for popularity within the rural regions, of course. 
Occasional landlords which still dotted the rural regions within the firm control of the Chinese Communist Party were more than enough to keep the necessity of patrols alive and well, not to mention the infrequent checkup patrols from Luhan's own forces, irredeemably poorly equipped as they usually were. The Chu made their way to the end of the dirt road. Having long finished around with the farms, Leo always enjoyed talking with the people, even if it was born out of necessity and habit. Hearing the stories of the landlords, how different things used to be. It was always interesting to hear what, what the world used to look like before we made a difference. Walking down the dirt road, words with the people always made for good food for thought. As the village receded from sight and the for clamor of the woods rose in tune, Lee's thoughts returned to that of a good soldier. His attention turned back to the noises around him. After all, that's all he could do. That's all anyone could ask of him. And contact Vietnam. A nation in a situation considerably similar to our own, Vietnam, has been entrenched in a partisan war notably similar to our own. Both of our nations have been grinding down on these communist partisans and believe that many of our shared problems may be sharing leaders as well. Well, Bao, Bao Dai has been caught in this war just as we have. It seems to be working with similar proficiency. We'll be wasting an opportunity to share information and fighting tactics. In this war against the Chinese Communist Party, we need as much help as we can get. It goes without saying that this insurgency is weakening our government's hold over our re rural regions. And we may soon have no choice but to end this war and do it fast. Insurgencies are acting. Oh boy. How many guns do we not have? We have 38. Yeah, I want to rush this one as much as fast as possible. Maybe training these guys is a bad idea, but whatever. Um, having more motorized doesn't really matter too much to me right now. Ooh, do we actually have five? Oh, we have three guns! That's good. We definitely need to get some anti-tank It's motorized, but really more anti-tank first. Artillery is going to be super, super important. So my goal is probably to establish like some really just basic units to help hold the line, and then have a couple really specialized units to uh, attack enemies and stuff. So, Alright, so which one's the next one we want to do? The one on the right we want to wait. And it's these. Uh, oh, that's not bad. Yeah, this one is god awful to do. This route. Mm, yeah, that's not really good. Mm, yeah, I'll probably do Ghost of the Pass. Across you not. Covert NRA operations be begun or been in full swing since the crushing of the Chongqing and the establishment of Luhan's rule over Yunnan. This operation was initially believed to be low-level crime and robbery, though it was now clear as to just how extensive these insurgency or insurgents are within Yunnan. After some preliminary reports against the organizations, clear just as just how powerful the NRA has become and how much of a threat it stands to become against Luhan's government. Thanks to the connections with Burma and low-level government officials, not to mention current the favor of countless landlords, the NRA partisans, perhaps the biggest external threat to the regime, have become the most influential leaders of the black market. And Stan has become strong enough to rise up and cause serious trouble for Luhan. If we strike now, though, we'll be strangling this uh, certainty in the crib, and we will certainly manage to survive this horrible ordeal. The zealot flourishes. <clears throat> Just as with many others born in the midst of China's century of humiliation, Zheng Zemin had a strange background. Born in 26, he was originally an undergraduate in the National Central University of Nanjing. When the war ended and a ceasefire was signed, Zheng graduated with a bachelor's degree. Looking around, he noticed that Luhan had allowed a continuation of the NSAU, formed by universities that had retreated from the mainland, so Zheng moved to Yunnan to pursue his academic dreams instead of staying under the society of those Japanese and Hanjiang scum he had long despised. His old friend Wang Jiaoyu, Jiao Yu, who had given Zheng the idea in the first place, followed him to Kunming. The NSAU, appreciating Zhang's competence in town, jumped at the chance of having him work with him. Eventually, he got a doctorate, which he then used to become a professor of electrical engineering at the university, but as he continued his engineering work, he became increasingly advocating for the claims and opinions of the NPA in Yunnan, as well as those of the student dissidents in Nanjing. One day after completing his lectures, Zhang went on his way back home. His ruminations were interrupted by some police who recognized Zhang as a political dissident and attempted to stop him. This was, in fact, just an attempt to extort the well-dressed Zhang to make a voluntary contribution to their poor salaries. Jing began to rebuke them in fluent, in fluent Japanese, as responsible police officers were left with no choice but to apologize and nod stupidly and run away. This was a regular part of Jiang's routine. Watching the officers run away, he thought that as much as he had hated to pick up Jap Japanese, it served him darn well so far. Returning home, Jiang began his nightly work, writing notes and reports to his comrades and organizing names that needed strong attention after all, or at least after that. He had said about writing a letter about Yunnan's situation and his experience so far to a friend of his in Jing. Competence and mystery. Very cool. Contact Vietnam. No Vietnam. Go to the past. What do we do? Another thing here? Focus on the NRA. Oh, we can do this one. Yeah, no. I don't want to lose 200 guns for no reason. I just completely ignore it, so. I really want maybe. I don't mind having recon. I think engineers would be better for this one. Yeah, engineers would definitely be better. Because it gives you more entrenchment. And that's what we're, I'm really looking for. Recon goes down. Gives you more breakthrough, defense, soft attack, hard attack, tr better terrain traits, somewhat. So, there is that option. 200 something, that's not bad. We do need some more support equipment, though. But 
the Burma Road in danger. A constant threat to the Burma Road has always been and continues to be the NRA. Like an insufferable council that knows no bounds, the NRA has been feeding off of the Burma Road to sell their own goods and profit off whatever they can steal. Not a month ago, the NRA had blown up a convoy making its way from Azad Hind government. This is far from the beginning and far from the end. Even so, it can mark the beginning of the end. Or a double efforts to secure the Burma Road. Between providing additional garrisons and cracking down on known cells, will do nothing short of obliterate the regional NRA. That is a hope, and should our troops do their job, we only have reason to believe that these operations will succeed. The festival begins, though. Both cousins watched the pyre burn from afar. The golden, oh, the golden light brought out the fest features of the faces in sharp relief to the almost pitch blackness from behind. Darkness, which normally would have concealed several careful ears, listening patiently for whatever they would say. But today, those ears would not be hiding anywhere. They would be dancing with everyone around, everyone else around the fire. The torch festival was the most sacred occasion of the year to the Yi people. A loyalty that ran as deep as that to the Chinese nation for Long Yun and Lu Han. This year, the relief of a good celebration was needed more sorely than ever. And so the full resources of the state were devoted to a festival more stunning and lavish that, than any that had ever been held in Yunnan. It was also a good excuse to send to the remotest part of the country, whose government functionaries that were really just the Yunnan or Nanjing's regime's eyes and ears, and escaped to Zhao Tong, where the loyalty of the local people was guaranteed. This was their homeland, hometown, and no big way for many other parts of the world would be honored over the local heroes who had earned such a distinction in the war, regardless of what someone had done after. Finally, the moment came. The festival was full in full swing. And over the loud beating of drums and hearty crackle of flames, Luhan and Long Yun spoke to each other for probably for the first seven months, maybe even years. You know why I want to speak with you, Long Yun began in almost accusatory tone, but perhaps it was well deserved. And I do, and I know what you lack the full picture, but now we can speak freely. Let me at least explain myself. And so the night proceeded. The fight without end. Zhao had wondered, in his great abundance of spare time, as to what the notion of nationalism was exactly, specifically, given what that what had happened in China. What well, remains of the NRA really really had a moment to breathe since evacuating however it could. It just so happened that Zhao's cell had been hiding within northern Bur Burma, right alongside what remained of the Burma Road since 1937. Zhao had spent his time fighting for China's freedom from Wuhan to Chongqing and finally to where he sat now, and a scout in the ad hoc training camp which had been bringing in young men and pumping out soldiers for that Zhao could, could blame few others than himself. Zhao, a fresh batch coming in 30 minutes, fre face had half peeked into the tent, letting out a sigh. Zhao heaved himself off of his bedside and was w hit with the overwhelming realization of why he was training and not one raiding the Burma Road. Of course, all he could do was all could do their part with China one way or another, and Zhao would not stop until China was free one way or another. Stepping out in front of the disorganized line of confused volunteers, they started to be talking, taking in the camp until they noticed Zhao in his chest of iron medals, marching towards the chattering collection of young men. By the time Zhao had walked up to the end of the line, the crowd had completely silenced. Thinking to a speech, Zhao began walking down the aisle. Now it's come to my attention, gentlemen, that you all hope to liberate China, liberate it of Japanese influence, liberate it of its authoritarianism. You all hope to bring liberation to China, and you've joined us in our war against the collaborators to the rats in Japan. For that, I must thank you, for no one else ever will. And another batch had come around, and the festival ends. Lu Han, when I gave up the right to govern and left it to you, I did it believing you would follow my footsteps, that you would work in the best interest of our people and our nation. And that is a philosophy which has guided my actions for the last two decades. Cousin, the war's over. It's long been over. Resisting Japan and their lapdogs in China and pointless. They control everything in Asia. The best path is simply working with them and securing a pace for Jinan in their new order. Uh, Long Yun listened patiently. People in different difficult situations often have to convince themselves of the enemy's propaganda in order to survive, in order to make some sense of of the world. Lu Han would realize that soon. And, <clears throat> as walking in Tokyo's shadow served us so, this morning I decided to visit a shop in the outskirts of Kunming, not where we usually go as a government of servants. The owner was a woman missing a hand who had wrapped it in a foul, seeking bandage covered in blood. She was practically on death's door, yet still had to work to afford what little rice she could. Her husband had died some weeks ago in a mine, the ba Baoshan's number no. 5 zinc mine, the inauguration of in which we both attended, and all she got was a letter commending his sacrifice from the company. This is the nation you've built, Lu Han. Is this really what we wanted? At this point, all at all, Lu Han could was butter. Nonsense, he called it. Cherry picking, but the words had hit him deep, and in his heart of hearts, he could not help but agree. Nothing showed to Long Yun, however, and his hope. <clears throat> And his hopefulness at getting Lu Han to understand soon began to wither. He tried one last time to convince him. I know you are regarded by the people as a king, cousin, but I am the leader here. And you seem to be trying to influence me in some other direction. I know what I'm doing. There was no use. Bitter gripped as hard as the king realized that there was no other option. As Lu Han blabbered on about some other inane thing, Long Yun stared deep into the pyre as it rolled away. For my life leaves my body, I alone will free Yunnan of her shackles one way or another. The two first lady. Madame Sun Yat-sen's manor in Nanjing is guarded by four soldiers, not to protect her, no, but to keep her in. The collaborators saw her, her a threat to their, to their regime, as they would be correct. Had she been free, there was no saying what she would be off west, where rumors had abounded of old KMT and communist partisans continuing insurgency or fitting from city to city. 
Flitting. Spreading the word of liberation, equality, preparing resistance networks for that one glorious day where China slumbered and choked by the change of the samurai and the collaboration would free itself, yes. She was indeed dangerous, but she was also a potential resource, they thought. Wang Jing Wang. Jing Wei had perverted the image of the KMT to the point of being beyond recognition, but he had still maintained a facade of tracing his government's lineage from her late husband's movement, as to the wife of Dr. Sun. Uh, the Madame's approval would be more mountains to advance the regime's legitimacy. In contrast, killing her would also ser sever the already non existent link between the father of the nation and their rule, and so Wang and Gao after him had endeavored time after time to persuade and threaten their weight into a statement in support of the government from her. Every time for twenty years, she had all but laughed in their faces. She had not bowed to the tyrant Chiang Kai shek, let alone an unabashed traitor to the nation and his imperial puppet masters. They placed in her house, arrest, to neutralize her. But they would have been fools to think that she was powerless within the mansion's four thick walls. She still kept, kept contact with the dissidents, within and without, to the, the state's apparatus, who still resisted the collaborator's rule. The pen would be her new saber in the battle for China. She picked up the fountain pen, fetching a new piece of paper. Esteem Jing Zemin. Yeah, keep the peepee. -pee. I don't know if the peepee, -pee, we're really going to need a lot of peepee -pee later, but we're going to keep it just in case for now. Send soldiers to the border. Uh, actually, let's take a look here. How strong is the NRA? Uh, maybe we could probably do it. Who? Where, where is the? Is it here? No. Who the army situation? The yeah, NRA, NPA, but NRA is 4.5. So, since soldiers to the board. It seems as though with every strike made against the NRA insurgents, with every revealed outpost and exhaust patrol, the Republicans can come back with their doubled resources and their doubled spirits. As uh, of our most recent reports, the NRA seem to be concentrating much of the renewed manpower on the Burma Road, most likely in an effort to recommence their countless back market operations to regain their lost power. And if we act fast, however, we may have no reason to fear these developments. By increasing our presence along the border of Burma, as well as our total present troops within the Burma Road itself, we will not only counteract the growing NRA presence, but also manage to turn the tide against the disruptive republicanism. With better luck and skill, of course. And then, contact Burma for cooperation. We cannot strike the NRA alone, certainly not with the limited power within our jurisdiction. As a result, our wisest leader, Luhan, has made an effort to reach out to the Burmese government, coordinate a properly coordinated force against the NRA, and secure the Burma Road. Should all go to plan, we'll be able to use the combined powers of the United and Burmese armies. It's imperative that this meeting goes to plan. Should we fail to coordinate a sizable force capable of crushing the NRA, then we're liable to lose out on the money not only being taken out of our own pockets, but the NRA will also gain a considerable foothold in the region. Well, far from a death blow, we will certainly be set back on our efforts, which is something we cannot afford. Another easy victory. It's funny how time could change everything that Zhao had come to know. Since the days of Sun Yat-sen, to Japan's invasion all these years ago and find the crushing of Chongqing, where Mao and Qin Kai-shek had died fighting side by side, every other day seemed the very fabric of China shifted. And today was no different. Today the decision was made by the NRA High Command, which apparently existed, to expand operations across Burma and into Yunnan. To facilitate this, making use of the extensive or excessive troops pouring in from Yunnan proved far from enough, and all hands were called on deck. It just so happened that Zhao found himself with a pair of those hands. Enough experience in the forties to get caught with the rank of officer. It was more or less a ceremonial role, however, as officers had rarely engaged in active combat. And all orders had come in from the generals and high command, which had just come out of mothballs. While his unit was being assigned to the biggest raid on the Burma, Burma Road since forty-seven, then came something to surprise to him. Laying in the trees, alongside half a dozen other former trainees, it seemed as though they had forgotten about spacing. It didn't really bother Zhao. He couldn't be bothered to be bothered. Frankly, besides, so far as Zhao could tell, it wasn't even close. Between the two militias to fight for him, he would prefer his own a thousand to one. That was also an accurate statistic, which was mildly concerning. The rumbling began to grow. Over the roads ahead of them, snapping Zhao out of the cloud of thoughts, they could already see it. A small convoy of trucks, two APCs, and one line of what seemed to be heavily armed refugees. Otherwise, doing Yunnan's best and brightest. All right, you boys ready? The glorified parson chuckled. The NRA grows stronger. 4.5, huh? Five point nine from uh, the NRA, not bad. Bands are negative, so which is pretty good for now. MPA. Can the can they hold the country together as the SNP did? I don't know, but it's only in September, and we're left forty three minutes in this video, so we'll see. Hey, there we go. Nice. This is absolutely worth it. Nice. Very good, actually. Very, 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 very good. In the meantime, all this other stuff, like I said, it's just not worth it. No. No, we don't want to lose command. Well, command fires we don't really care about too much, but. Carrot and stick is not terrible. I want to save every PP, though. But, leaves on a vine. And this one, last one is. It's a, uh, we're not going to lose political power. I refuse to. Nature never ran out of things to discover. There's always more to see beyond that which is human. Zhang Zhuling did not have much reason to doubt this, as complete certainty in one's knowledge of the world was a clear fool's errand in this day and age. The trees such a hilltop, seemingly gently kissing the green hills. A subversion of which, of which they truly were. 
as being stout and strong trunks, a bark that could take an axe swing or four. On the vines and their adoring leaves, he saw the droplets of mildew and condensation mix and combine and spill it, and race down, dropping off, touching the ground with a sound so slight you could only hear it when he stared at it. For the drops arrived on the leaf again, and began the eternal cycle anew. A scratch on the window he had to see nature from seemed part of the world by itself by now. Perhaps a general inter integral change in nature's appearance. Perhaps a rift in the world. The house was his world, after all, and his years in it had started to make every perfection magnified ten thousand fold until a bend in the needle head would go a crack in his home's foundation. He turned to the letters. The home was not a battlefield. His home, at least, was spa spared from the marks of war, but a general has no need for a battlefield, even when a ba battle is optional. What needed is men. And men there were written in the addresses of letters to those who were granted pleading calls, training with politeness and subtleties and calls for the end of peace. And the secret army of the dissidents, from home waged the beginnings of the war. <clears throat> the young marshal's years since the rightful application of such a title, years since the relevance of himself, but only a short time before a resurgence was building connections for something new. He wondered how successful he would be, of course. He hoped, ambiguously yet with vigor, contacted Burma for cooperation. And the bandits of the southwest. Throughout the mountains of the southwest and Yunnan, there were laid despicable disease of Yunnan, which had only grown in size since it was first identified nearly 20 years ago. As in older, within Yunnan's first faded, and then gave way to widespread banditry in the uncrossable lands of the mountains and rivers of the southwest. These blights on both humanity and Yunnan have done nothing but disrupt their economy and threaten the lives of their landlords. This ends now. Every long, hard campaign, what else to be done if we hope to? If we hope for our most loyal landlords to remain safe and happy, but beginning a series of anti-terrorist operations from the southwest, we'll begin the long process of properly unrooting these mad bandits from Yunnan. All will take its time. Let's see the military. The problem with Yunnan is not the lack of valorous men. Even today, the villages, towns, and cities hold men with the spirit of those who came before them, who fought the countless invaders, and will fight countless more with no less vigor, or no loss of vigor. The problem is the lack of unifying spirit. A reason to fight, perhaps the lack of true leaders. The Yunnanese soldier today fights for no higher ideals than his next paycheck, and the Yunnanese general does not even fight. He spends his days gleefully savoring the pleasures of his life with no concern for such mundane comments as service or duty. It also certainly does not help that both Tokyo and Nanjing take an extremely dim view of arming the peripheral Chinese states any more than the bare minimum. With next to nothing for a police force and armed guard, the army must fulfill all these roles within, with a fraction of material or manpower needed. The average soldier finds himself extorting poor peasants and incapable of paying their taxes, shooting at unarmed partisans whose only crime was attempting to survive in a state that made no room for them, and after a long day of such actions, listening to broadcasts after broadcasts extolling the virtues of pan-Asian cooperation and the new world order that China finds herself in. With a leader and commander or chief in such a pathetic state, as no one of the common soldiery feels no loyalty to the cause and no comradeship with the past. Luhan's army continues to atrophy and rot, and one must wonder, is there any hope for the spirit of the glorious NRA 60th quarter to return? Perhaps not within this establishment. <clears throat> and of course, bands with Southwest, and you know what, at this point, um, these guys are not bad. We do definitely need more, but we don't have any anti-tanks, so we're going to do this, but, hmm, Battlefield. The feeling was clinging to his trachea again as he took another careless stroll along the familiar boulevard. Even though it was just a business trip, or so to say, he still felt somewhat obliged to cherish rustling the Jingjiang's leaves and screeching tires against his asphalt ground after all those years away to wonder how this bustling hometown of his had even survived the nightmare two decades or more ago. Then again, he supposed nightmare was enough, enough a euthanism for reality. Nanjing stood, after all, barely 200 kilometers away. Liu Yi Lang smirked, yet his throat clenched. If the war had been a nightmare, then indeed he'd never woken up. The only difference being that his weapon was now a fountain pen instead of a rifle. Far too often he cried out in the headings into the dark, for whoever <clears throat> uh, was out there to wake up and see the absurdity of it all. Japanese marionettes atop the presidential palace, and far too often he had to silence himself with the ink from his own bottle. Far too often the boys back in Chongqing had told him, with trembling voices and drenched foreheads, that this was for the good as much as of himself as for their journal. And far too often he had to stifle a laugh. The new Sichuan daily used to pride itself on responsibility and on actually having a spine in the face of decadence. Where did it all go? The feeling was clinging to his trachea again. The feeling of suffocation, the smothered voices, the hollowness beneath the state-sponsored loudspeakers and the pan-Asian banners, all testaments to one undeniable, unconceivable truth. China was now free, far from it, and remains a part to play for Liu, and what like-minded, <clears throat> few like-minded compatriots out there, to make her so. It was why he had relocated Chongqing, in fact, to reconnect with them, dedicated his life to anything that wasn't Wang Jiang's or Jingwei's propaganda machine. Liu's footsteps were picking up pace once more, for his path still lay ahead. There remained ears to talk to until one day, hopefully, China would finally make herself heard. Amidst the darkness, the fighter seeks its path. Nice. Land of Thieves. Of. Oh, I can't even read it. Of historical gears? Of all the vital gears in the great machine of Lu Han's Yunnan, there are few as influential or profitable as the humble landlord. Having done more than their fair share for the economic prosperity of Yunnan, it goes without saying that those within our territories who hold the title of the landlord are more than within their rights to demand protection and security, in light of the ep bandit epidemic across Yunnan. <clears throat> it's high time that we fulfill our promises to these landlords. 
Through cooperating with the afflicted landlords and further cracking down on those glorified thieves, we're liable to burn right through this little problem of banditry. Do we have another one here? Talk with Burma. Oh. Securing the approval of Burma for an infrastructure project is crucial to the success of our plans. While we could, in theory, construct the road entirely on our own, we must still seek permission for the Burmese government to begin construction inside the Burmese territory. Moreover, we could convince Burma to carry a part of the project's costs, lessening the short-term financial impact of this endeavor. However, Burma is not the richest state inside the sphere. If we want to convince them of our idea, we must be willing to offer some incentives and, and uh, investments ourselves. You know what? Why not? The Burma Road. China's lifeline, when she made her daring yet ill-fated stand against the forces of darkness more than 20 years ago, what would have been Yunnan's lifeline today, too, if its traffic lanes had not been rendered half decrepit by the con conflagration of war, congested by rubble and haunted by the National Revolutionary Army remnants smoking running amok among our borders? But it's a lifeline we have inherited nonetheless, and one we must revitalize for the sake of our mission. Now, of course, an uh, impressive, ambitious, ambitious project reviving the Burma Row will take interregional diplomatic grid of the highest caliber. A special task force of the most capable experienced diplomats, Jinan, has to offer has been assembled. Their destination is, of course, Burma. Their objective to obtain Burmese government assistance in restoring the Burma Road's pathways back to working order, both the better armed garrisons along the way against the interlopers, and to get the motorcades of cash goods and personnel flowing through our mountain ranges unpestered once more. Unfortunately, said task force consists of a single elderly man who refused their assignment for political reasons. A second less capable and more inexperienced task force has been assembled, consisting of the sons of prominent government officials. They have been given a week-long ca crash course over the finer points of negotiation. A written trade proposal with words derived exclusively from children's stories and a large amount of cash to bribe away and problems that, would, uh, that words cannot al alone solve. As long as it keeps smiling, no one asks it too difficult a question, everything should go smoothly. Jinan goes with them. Profits and Partitioning the Jinanese and Burmese delegation sat across from another. <clears throat> Subject of conversation started detail concerning the Burma robe, but quickly devolved into jokes and out of conversation. And the woman looked at him and said, But I'm Japanese! The room burst into laughter before gradually subsiding into isolated chuckles. That reality is quite funny, but we should return to the matter of the hand. How much can we expect to, pro to profit from the Burma robe? The most sober Jinanese <clears throat> diplomat, noticing the blank stares of his companions, opened his mouth and uttered a response, Well, you know. He desperately searched his mind for something, anything about the projected income from the Burma Road. He really wished he had read the official, official looking papers sitting on the floor of his hotel room. The way I see it, he began. It was suing in little oceans of cash. Increase the benefits. With higher political costs, persuade him. Plenty of profit. Moderate benefits. Ooh. Higher political costs. I don't know how good it is. Uh, you should get your hopes up. You know what? Let's go big or go home for that one. The price to pay. Hmm, came the response. We should have moved to the discussion of cost then. What should we expect of the project to cost us? Well, money, obviously. The Burmese government gave an exasperated sigh. How much money? How much money will it cost us in that moment? Jinanese diplomat tried, vainly to appreciate the concept of cost. Things cost money, he knew that, or at least he presumed that. He never actually bought anything. He always just told servants what he wanted, and they went to go to the market where, theoretically, they exchanged money. The cost for the requested item. He didn't the fancy idea how much money those things cost, or what he considered expensive and what was considered cheap. He heard it said he just wanted to be done with the boring meeting. I think it'll cost, he said slowly, as though trying to understand the words coming out of his mouth. A lot. Roads are pretty expensive, right? Average cost or whatever it is. Increased cost of the project. Um, reduce our costs. I'll go middle one. And the warmongers. I do want to do that one next before the line of le these ones. So, eh, maybe not. Eh, we'll do a lot of these next anyways. Burma's approved the project. Our junior diplomat sent to Burma some time ago finally returned to us, albeit intoxicated and with a few new, few new girlfriends. After digging through their luggage, we discovered the legal documents certifying that the Burmese government has approved the Burma Road project. According to the least inebriated among them, the talks went extremely well after both parties discovered their mutual passion for card games and alcohol. After a few games and bottles, the Burmese diplomat were more than willing to support the construction of the Burma Road. The diplomat groundwork is solid. All that remains is comparatively easy. A little groundwork. Splendid. That costs us way too much. Plan the new Burma Road. Focus and discipline. The woods were silent as they always were, and that was why son Liren always came in here to run for exercise. But it was a peaceful sort of silence, entirely unlike the country that supposedly ruled over these woods, of course. More important than the background of his runs was that he should always consistently run. As not only kept the physical body and spine fear in order, and most importantly, instilled discipline. Discipline was something that no soldier, from the young to the old, could afford to miss out on. That was a lesson Sun had learned many times, too often the hard way. 
Unlike many of his fellow generals of the National Revolutionary Army, Sun had not been faced with a choice of joining the collaborating puppet government or being in prison. Rather, Nanjing seemed to have contented itself with a sort of internal exile to the province of Guangxi. Although their actual control in the province was loose at the best of times, Sun still did what he could to keep his end of the bargain and avoid stirring up unrest against the national government. After all, he didn't have to when Nanjing did that themselves through their corruption and incompetence. If only he had straightened them out, with the exact same discipline he had expected from his soldiers, then perhaps life for the average person wouldn't be so unbearable. No matter, the Chinese people would seek justice one day, with or without the support of the government. For that reason, Sun had to stay in shape and continue to learn the latest military theories. Should he one day be expected to help once more in China's fight for freedom, he had to do everything he could towards achieving that end. A vigilant old man awaits and watches. Nice. Yeah, we're losing quite a bit of political power every day, aren't we? Deficient administrative systems, unrest in Jinan. God dang it. It's pretty bad. But I was told to just kind of ignore it, so... Can't wait to get, till we get cooed. Oh. Oh, this one, okay. We can't do that one. It's fine. Oh, this one. CCP. Meh. <clears throat> when it comes to undertaking large-scale infrastructure projects, planning is everything. Let's make sure that our plans account for every problem that may arise during construction, no matter how small. We must prepare orders and timetables for the time of production and delivery of all required materials. Before construction of the Burma Road can begin, plans must be drawn up to ensure it's completed in an efficient, orderly manner. Three plans have been proposed so far. The first plan calls for rapid mass mobilization of the civilian workforce and the purchase of large amounts of industrial equipment and materials to complete the road as fast as possible. While the road will indeed be completed quickly, it also costs much more than it potentially needs to be. The second plan calls for balance between the expenses and time. The workforce shall be, still be mobilized, but will be heavily supplemented by saved labor. Materials and equipment purchases will be spaced out to keep prices low. The road will be completed in a reasonable amount of time for an appropriate cost. The third plan calls for frugality above all else. The road will be constructed almost exclusively with slave and conflict labor. Second-hand industrial equipment and excess unwanted materials will be secured cheaply, albeit very infrequently. The road will be dirt cheap, but it will take a long time to do. Get it done as soon as possible. You know what? Cost? I don't give a crap about cost right now. We're going to revive the Burma Road. With all the necessary permissions granted by the Burmese government and all plans prepared, we can, of course. <clears throat> Uh, finally set out to begin the revival of the Burmese road, however, the completion time is uncertain to us, namely, the strength of those traders hiding in the mountains will surely have their hands on this. On the other hand, it also indicates that the project can run smoother if their power projection is restricted to their miserable hideouts. Alright, so what do we did that? Garrison's not bad. Bandits? Okay. Growth? Yeah, it's pretty bad factory output. What's going to cost us more? Then again, it doesn't really matter. MPAA and NRA. Yeah. What turns a man to crime? That sky over Yunnan's highest mountains were beautiful. The stars and moon stood far above anything else, although they hardly caught the attention of the half dozen bandits that sat around the crackling fire, sharing stories and a pitifully small meal, if it could even be called that. Now, the most recent addition to the ranks of these bandits, however, was a man named Huang. By midnight, the moon was up. <clears throat> And the last bites of food had been eaten. All those left for the rest of the night were the stories. For lack of alternatives, Huang had taken the metaphorical stage. Well, Huang, how did you wind up here? The smiles were all sling lingering on the fire. Many were beginning to want to call it a night. The man in question was young, no older than 25, and had the face and posture of a hungry man, but it's certainly anything but the body of a starving man. Well, it came here from the northern Yunnan, actually. They're the landlords. They and Luhan Slugs. They did whatever they wanted. My family, you see. They thought, we thought it was typhoid. We worked to keep her healthy, traded with the closest we had to a pharmacist. We treated plenty of what we had for medication. We didn't make the rent. The circle grew quiet. All that could be heard was crackling of the flames. They came for us, for, or at least for our crops first. If there was anything which we had left. We were to give them everything we had, you know. They still came. They said all alike. There wasn't very much left by them, but they still called it a warning and expected us to pay the next week. Obviously, we all knew we couldn't, and they definitely knew, too. Otherwise, we wouldn't have left. The mountains grew completely silent, even as the fire faded in the ash. The mountains would only grow closer to total silence as the months grew longer. How strong is bandit power? Bandit power is not that strong. It's really not that strong at all. Show no mercy. Sure. Across all of you, none. All of our efforts to crush the NRA, CCP, bandits, and MPF shown limited success at best. While we do seem to be wearing down the distance at a considerable rate, it is proving far from fast enough to keep the dissonance down. Do we really want to purge you of these insurgents? We'll need to do everything in their power to rid ourselves of these terrorists. Everything. We have already reworked our tactics time and time again. I've already put our loyal troops on high alert. And we even have done everything that we can. Our troops then must be able to the ones who do more for you none. Our current restrictions on the troops are far more or less are more or less already loosely enforced, although they are far from harsh enough to deal with the countless insurgents. We are far past the time for mercy. No matter what it takes, we'll secure you none. And my God, we will secure it. We still have only four fact goddamn factories. My goodness. Just need more guns, 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 guns. Heck, 
I might even use militia instead of gun um, infantry, but that would be a bad idea. Desert sites. The distant sites seem to sim in the waves of the heat day. The northwestern desert sprawled before him. Dunes jutting out of the ground, sagging under the feather like motion of the air. Zheng Jingguo unscrewed the cap of his canteen before taking a deep drink. He squinted and raised his binoculars to level his eyes. On a map unfolded before him, he marked areas where ambushes might be possible, areas of shade under the sun, and hiding spots to help troops hide from the Japanese patrols. Kui's scouts dispatched by the Ma were probably more effective than he would be, and as the son of a late generalissimo, he didn't have to do any of this. Ma Ji Yuan looked at him incredulously when he first requested his scout work. However, man needs time for himself. On occasion, of course. Field work was an excuse. He wanted a quiet place to meditate, to contemplate events of the past and the future. The Ma's were friendly enough, loyal Chinese nationals to the core, whose personal emblem was a white sun of the blue sky, yet. Huddled in the camp amongst the din and noise of the soldiers returning, departing, living, and dying, Zhang could not find himself the space he needed to sit down and think. Now alone with the dunes of sand and the sharp, jagged shadows of rock formations, Zhang took a cigarette out and lit it. Suddenly, as he sucked in the fumes of the tobacco, he began to think and reminisce. Lost father, lost brother. He was not there for Chongqing and Wai Go Wao. Where it was nowhere to be found. Thoughts of his brother tugged at Zhang's mind. Had Wei Go known? The old journalissimo had hid things from the younger of the two siblings. Secrets that would surely shatter the brother had fostered under the house of Zhang. It shook his head. Zhang would tell Wai Go, well, Wai Guo, when the time was right, assuming, of course, they would live to see each other again. Please keep going up. Oh my goodness, please keep going up. But out of the mountain. Zhang had gotten used to this month, his monthly routines, and he began to take pride of what he did for a living. It took some time, but eventually found justification for his useless moral quandaries, if this was what anyone had needed to do to make a living. That was justified. It was, if there proved no alternative, then it was morally correct. So Wang reminded himself as he looked over the village ahead of him. It was an insulting sight. A dozen or so Yuan's army, already greatly concerning. Even more concerning was the army of citizens fortifying the center inter intersection. If the people had cooperated with the army of Yunnan, then Huang's gang had been raiding far too frequently, something to note for later. Huang's gang of similarly trained bandits would be beat back government forces consisting of twice their size was a harrowing thought, barely reassured by his allies around him. No, it'll work out. We have the element of surprise. This will work. It didn't even sound like the bandit had believed it, let alone convince the rest of the thieves. Anyone got any ideas? Huang asked a collection of bandits himself among them. The bandits was, were well defended. It became clear that the citizens may very well have been the, among the village's defenders. No, the gunfire from that farmhouse there. The bandit had continued to debate the best course of action. From the looks of it, things weren't looking up. We could always... No, no hold on, never mind. The group looked at each other, desperation painted across their faces. Maybe you should just go home. Subdued, but unbroken. In a happier time, before the Japanese imperials had started oppressing China in earnest, the men who called themselves the National Protection Army and Intimidation of Kai-E were merely the United Provincial Contingent of the National Revolutionary Army, of course. All that went to heck when the Japanese stormed through China, occupying it from Nanjing to Chongqing. Now the new MPA, subdued but unbroken, is filled to the brim with staunch revanchists. Opposed to any form of cooperation with the Japanese, Lu Han is aware of the existence. He also knows that their hardline mindset is shared by a large swath of Yunnan society. So he plays as part of appeasing them to prevent any violent rebellion. If they were to rebel some house and throw him down, Lu thinks they probably would fail to achieve much. After all, they would be facing off against the whole sphere were they to revolt. For now, an uneasy peace prevails between the MPA and the authorities. Tell what will come of this as the years pass, if Japan's hegemony begins to destabilize, or if the MPA manages to attach itself to this charismatic leader, that peace may come to an end. Who on earth knows what will come of Yunnan then? General Mercy, of course, one more bandit hunt. Our past actions? I know what the warmongers. An unfortunate, ever persistent aspect of the psyche of much of the Chinese military has been the notion of nationalism and revanchism against Japan in the East Asia prosperity sphere. This insubordination has been spreading order under the organization of the MPA and shows nearly no signs of stopping, but bluntly, the belief has refused to die within our ranks. Our objective is now to kill it. This belief has long been a thorn in the side of the peace loving Lu Han, has only served as a terrible memory of the worst that China's had to offer the co prosperity sphere. With some work, bullets, and sweat, however, we'll find him not to be even more loyal to the co prosperity sphere before than ever before. As much as I don't want to worsen our military professionalism, we do need to reduce their power, so. Who is it? Harris? Who the heck are the Har Harris? Huh. Alright, not bad. I do that one. Oh, oh, we can do this again. Oh, improve our... Oh, crap. We should have saved our political power. Well, it is what it is. Four mongers. Hmm. One more banner help. I mean, that's not bad. Revanchism in Jinan. As thanks to our recent unification with Jinan, we have found ourselves in the company of a great many bureaucrats and generals who had not prior adhered to our strict ideological regimentation. While well, this is obviously quite a blow to both our efforts of integration and our efforts of appeasing Japan, we may find a middle ground that can allow us to play the Japanese and these nationalistic elements off each other. 
Assuming we can find a way to keep the most extreme elements of these forces at bay, we can begin. We're both less than the influence of the pro-Japanese forces, as well as maintain some modicum of autonomy for Yunnan. It's a fine line which Luhan walks, between the nationals and the Japanese files. Should you play his cards right out, he may walk away without even the thought of opposition to his rule. Zhongqing days. Oh, we've got quite a bit here now. When he came to, he was there again. A field and above, the smell of gunpowder and smoke. He felt his face warm and whole. His eyes were functioning, his eyes, ears were ringing, but they were all right. He pulled his hands from his face and looked at them, blackened by ash, caked by dust. He blinked. He was alive. Ching was again in that city, the city of his father's last stand. Ahead, screams of Japanese, Banzai! They came from the serrating reply, Banzai! It crashed through the narrow streets of Chongqing, bloodied by warfare like waves frothing against the coast. Up above, columns of smoke upheld the azure sky. He squinted at the sun and let it raise, bore a hole in his eyes, black as an eclipse. They took him to the outskirts of the city, uh, past the ruined walls and breached gates caked by drying blood. A shiver went through him. Above the gatehouses, the Japanese had hung the bodies of the officers that had resisted to the bitter end. Among them was his father. His tears streaked his face, and anger raked his heart. No, he wanted to scream. No, next to him was the alleged body of Mao. The resemblance was there, the receding hairline. The Hunanese tones of the skin paled now as death cast its pall over the body. It didn't matter, he supposed. Alive, Mao was the most tenacious adversary in death. Strung up next to his father, he was a hero like none other. Nausea struck him, and he had to sit down. He perched above a rock, panting. A Japanese officer sidled up to him and offered an apologetic smile. What an end, the officer said, eh? The Mandarin was laced with an accent. It carried notes of the bonsais of before. He gave the officer a look. Pursing his lips, he thought of words. He thought of responses. In the end, he remained silent. In the distance, a bomb exploded the cheering of soldiers. Above it all, above it all, there was a demonic rattling in the sky and the walls everywhere. General, a voice thundered in front of him. General, the guard, rattled his prison cell. A message for you. He left a sheaf of paper on the floor and walked away. Zhang Wei Guo rose up and read the letter. Imprisoning the body does not incarcerate the soul. Through the winter years. It has been almost 20 years since Song Zian, Zilian has set a foot in China, nearly two decades since the foreign invaders desecrated his home and drove him and the NRA south into Burma. The years since have been since defined by their difficulty. In order to survive, the NRA had been forced to turn towards the criminal activities, the very nature of which Song could feel staining his soul. Yet they persisted from the hopes of returning to China and freeing future generations from subservience to the Japanese oppressors. It was his dream. This dream that propelled the NRA forward, the dishonor of these criminal deeds would, was minuscule compared to the shame that they would face if they did not attempt to drive out the invaders by any means necessary. So they could continue their work diligently, using the resources they had to master resist the Japanese in any way they could. However, an opportunity was presenting itself to the NRA, and Song Zilian was keen to take advantage of it. Song had gathered his cabinet together to address him on the state of the NRA. I know these years have been hard, he began. The things that we've well, we have done will blacken our souls for the rest of our lives. We've only done what we must to combat these foreign invaders that even now occupy our homeland. I'll remind you all that our position has been improving considerably in the recent times. Every day we welcome more defectors into our ranks, valuable comrades who are too disgusted to continue working with the Japanese soon, I assure you. These winter years will end and we will see a free channel once again. It'll all be worth it, and not always lapdogs. Afternoon, Zesheng, and an Ampu gestured towards the seat opposite of his office desk and placed a manila folder alongside a collection of letter, paper, ink, stamps, and pens. What's this, Ampu? Sitting down, Zesheng reached towards the folder, now visibly marked as being top secret. Inside, Zesheng found a collection of papers, all of them bearing the face of one general or another, as well as a short biography as a, at a glance. And, uh, what is this? The two looked at one another for a moment or two. No, 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 absolutely not. We cannot afford this. As an Enpu looked at Zhe Sheng with a smile on his face and dipped one of the two pens into the inkwell. You can't be serious. You know we can't do this. What if Luhan finds out? And Enpu's pen nearly touched the paper before he placed it aside. I'm not spending another year with Japan holding us with such a close leash. And I know if anyone here doesn't want the head of Luhan as much as me, it's you. Enpu took the second pen and dipped it into the inkwell. Extending sand to Zhe Sheng, pen and fist, they locked eyes again. Zhe Sheng was far from smiling. We're getting these people inside. If our butts, we don't. They'll join, they'll want nothing more. And purge the military. Well, the revanchist and nationalist aspects of the Yunnan army have proven a strong counterbalance to the Japanese influence. The most vocal elements are proving a clear threat to Luhan's government. With each passing day that these radical officials and gar generals remain in their government and more and more upstanding individuals are being tricked into the notion of opposing or opposition to the co-prosperity sphere, this can obviously not stand. And we have to maintain the stability of Yunnan. We will need to put these officials down like the rabid dogs they are. While we cannot outright ex execute many of these individuals, as they are far too popular and influential even behind bars, they can be taken out of the picture for the foreseeable future. Should this effort succeed, the MPA movement will be crippled, and Yunnan's military will be put back on the right path. An afternoon in Hanoi. They gained a friendship that met Guangxi from Vietnam. Was like a friend after all his years. A welcoming hand that guided him on the next stop of his journey, as he had done for so many others like him. It was an unmistakable fe feeling for Chen, a communist who had made this trek many times between going his, his infiltration in southern Yunnan and the remaining and the remains of the part in Vietnam, and he had someone important to meet. Hmm. With that one. <clears throat> it took place secluded in Hanoi. 
As Chen met three expected figures, two generals, Chinese like him, a pair of familiar faces who agreed to him warmly, but the third he knew in, in a different manner, the tout and sinewy figure, the leader of the Viet Minh, Vietnam's own united front against the Japanese, who was known as the most enlightened one, Ho Chi Minh. After a brief drink and exchanging of pleasantries, the General Yang Cheng Wu turned to Chen as they all sat together. Tell me, what information do you have from Yunnan? Well, things have definitely changed, Chen began. Long, Long Yun has taken a lesser role in governing ever since the end of the war. He's had his share power with his cousin, Lu Han, who now is a recognized leader as far as Japan is concerned. The main problem is bandits, though. The pet countryside is washed with them, both resistance networks and the bandits seek prof seeking profit. Lu Han is at least attempting to deal with them, though for now there's still a significant thorn in his side. An opportunity, perhaps. He sp Ho spoke plainly, yet intuitively. Has experience practically radiating off of him in waves. If they cannot control their countryside, then there are untold amounts of people they cannot control. If they can be made to lose more control of the people, they will not be able to truly control their land. He was a man full of wisdom, after all. It was no wonder he had forged such a prominent movement here in Vietnam. Chen had to interject, however, perhaps, but something else to consider. From what I had been hearing, Lu Han is attempting to follow the model of the Nanjing government and trying to modernize the province, probably Japan's self, lots of new initiatives. New workers, it may be a way in. The three other three men shared a look and smiled. He made a contribution to the cause, and that made Chen smile too. Under the shelter of friends, Mao's disciplines plan. And reactionary thought, of course, Virgin Military. Not a bad idea. All men are brothers, with those shouts. Oh boy. Oh, hey! Our credit rating improved. Look at that. That's really nice, actually. I, did, I forgot about that. Oh, and there we go. Well, the shout of the tax collectors are still swelling in his blood-filled ears. Oh, way bent down to rest. All I could picture in his mind's eye was the terror of the face of those who warned him before his escape. He knew himself how ruthless they were. His debts had piled high, and the bailiffs would stop at nothing to seize what was owed. So he had decided to hold on to the last thing he could salvage, his own life. The breathless escape which had followed left his limbs aching, seized by acid. Now the sharpness of the pain could be felt all across his body. It was so excruciating that he had laid down on a bed of rocks as if they were an imperial mattress. The way he breathed. Deep in, then sharply out, slowly the stillness of the air returned, though something he had not felt in far too long, and now that much of the anxiety that is of his depth had been cut loose, he could finally breathe. Somewhere along the road, the shadow of a man shimmered. He was not alone, more followed. Wei clutched the few belongings he had close to his chest. His legs went stiff, eyes watered over, lungs still gasping for air. It was already obvious how impossible it was for him to keep running. Eventually, they reached him. Wei heard their whispers, creeping closer and attempting to beg for them to let him live, but they were not interested. One pressed gently at the... By one of his wounds, another lifted his head from the cool rocks, and he surrendered to them completely. There's always peace for the persecuted. Hey, we're fair? Holy. That's not bad. We're better than some of the Russian warlords. We get all the way up to good. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. Help. Uh, I don't think we need help with this. Still only four production units, but right now my goal is just to get more industry. Um, what would be best? Construction speed is nice. Don't really need it though right now. Monthly population research speed, prison effects, army organization regain. Civilian factories require more steel. Well, let's go to the economy tab. Do we have enough steel? Oh, we got enough steel. Yeah, we definitely have enough steel for that. Hey, got 50 public power though. Improve this one. As much as I want to revive the Burma Road right now. Active. Ooh, but mm, you know what? This one's still pretty good to do. It is a CCCP power. But admin efficiency slowly continues to improve more and more every month. Actually, where are we at for here? Deficient administration. Yeah. Getting over here would be really good. Yeah. As much as I want to do the Burma Road, we'll do that one next probably. Yeah. Um, administration, production units, production factor. Well, we need more of this. Engineers would be nice. Gun stuff would be nice. Enables automatic cannon. Probably not going to really use that one too much. Um, let's just... Ooh, research speed, though. Ooh, we'll get that one. I should have that one earlier, whatever. Revanchism. And reactionary thought. One more bandit hut. Patience. Yeah. Let's do this one. Lu Han was not a foolish man. While others might react rashly in the anger and rage, he had learned from many years in battlefield the valve calming down and then only acting. It was a skill that had served him well then, and it did so now, because of the all-consuming fury he had felt the moment he learned that Zheng Zesheng and Empu had secretly been working for the MPA movement and nearly made him order their execution on the spot. But that would have been the move of a fool, Terran, or despot, none of which he was. After a few moments and a few deep breaths, the situation slowly resolved itself with greater clarity in his mind's eye. 
Zheng Zixiang and, 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 and Enpu were both invaluable assets to Yunnan, the former in the army and the latter in the civilian government. Unlike the other useless lumps that populated the halls of power, they were likely both diligent and hardworking. Finally, their own personal influence was far more considerable. There would be a significant number of men who would greatly resent any action taken against them. Keeping your friends close, but keep your enemies even closer. Words whose wisdom have been proven many times over the pages of history, and now will be proven again. Zhang and An An could be valuable sources of information if they were lulled into a false sense of the security and observed. The spy had brought forward the information of the treachery was to be rewarded with a higher job or organizing this. As they sat back, all the details of the plan rapidly organized themselves one by one. The lower elements of the NPA conspiracy would be taken down with the two eyes ranks clueless. Then, when there was no one left but them, he would strike. After all, a bowl is most useful when it is empty. Mm, I don't want to do end your actionary thought. The only way we can put a proper complete end to the NPA movement is if it stopped in its tracks. Of everything which we need to do to ensure the security of the Yunnan army, maintaining control of those within our ranks will be an absolute priority. Through bugging the officers of our high command, hiring tales for those who we remain suspicious of, and encouraging new recruits to report suspicious behavior of his senior members, Yunnan will be made infinitely safer than when crawling with traitors. These actions will only strengthen Yunnan as a whole, no matter the measures which we are forced to implement. If those within the army grow angry, they will be reassured by the fact that that is all in the name of United States National Security. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we will, of course, continue trying to resist more of the co-prosperity sphere. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.